All righty. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Jake. I'm from Syracuse, New York. And uh, here at UNC Chapel Hill, I'm majoring in anthropology and contemporary European politics with a minor in either Russian or Spanish, not decided yet because I'm only a first year. And uh, my travel experience is before coming to UNC, we have a program here that allows students to take a fully funded gap year before coming to UNC. So I applied for that program and then was in our cohort. And uh, I spent my gap year mainly in Havana, Cuba and in Navajo Nation, which is uh, an indigenous nation um, in New Mexico, Arizona and Utah. And then I also did some travel to Scandinavia, to Mi'kma'ki, which is uh, Nova Scotia, my mother's homeland, and to Israel. I speak English, Spanish, basic Navajo, and I'm learning Russian in Mi'kmaq. And my other interests are music. I'm in an acapella group here, it's very college. And uh, I play violin. Um, I do a lot of traditional beadwork, and then I'm also into politics and activism. And I'm curious, as those of you that are in the room in high school, if, uh, if you're taking Spanish classes, if you want, you can hit the yes button. If you click the participants and yes, we can see who all is learning Spanish just because we're talking about Spanish speaking countries today. You can hit yes or no. See some. And who else is just learning a language in general, too? You can click the yes button if you're learning another language. Great. Guys, are any of y'all in Spanish right now? Or did you take Spanish last year? I see a few, yeah. And I know you guys are still on block schedule, right? Or no? Yes. So some people might have it next semester. Okay, great. All right. And um, yeah, history of Cuba. And that will kind of help you to understand what Abe was gonna talk about when it comes to immigration. Thank you, Liz. Uh, so to lay a bit of framework, like we said, Cuba is really close to the U.S. It's just 90 miles from Florida. Um, it only took me about an hour and a half to fly there from Atlanta, Georgia. So it's closer to us than California is even. And um, so Cuba was inhabited by three indigenous groups, mainly the Taino, the Guanajatabe, and the Sibone before colonization. Um, the first people well, Christopher Columbus arrived there in the late 1400s, and then in 1511, it was first colonized in the east at Baracoa. After that, the city of Havana was founded, which I'm sure you've heard the name. Um, there was significant Spanish, French, and enslaved African populations, as well as some other minority populations, like there are still indigenous descended communities. There's a uh, Chinese community, Lebanese community, Jewish community, all in Cuba. And uh, historically, for the countries which colonized it, it was a powerhouse for raw materials like sugar, and then for uh, things that you make out of sugar, for example, rum, which is what made Cuba extremely wealthy in addition to tobacco. And we said, we mentioned this or in um, one of the elementary presentations, but have you guys heard the song Havana by Camila Cabello? You might have heard of that song before. She's from Cuba. You can give me a yes or a no, and let me see, let me pull up my participants. Um, Sarah, you can let me know if you've heard that song or not. That was popular, I don't know, about a year ago. Some yeses, some noes. Okay. So a little on the war for Cuban independence. Um, between 1893 and 1898, uh, the Spanish-American War was happening, and the Cuban War for Independence was part of the Spanish-American War. Um, the U.S. was fighting on the side of the Cuban rebels against Spain, and the U.S. ultimately took over Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, as well as tons of other small islands that had been part of Spain um, or colonies of Spain. So the U.S. then occupied Cuba in 1901. There was this thing called the Platt Amendment, which was essentially an American law that said Cuba gets to be independent, but we get to control them however we want. So uh, their government, their foreign policy, um, everything that happened had to go through the U.S. before it could happen. So in 1902, um, Cuba officially got independence, but they weren't really independent. Um, and the U.S. still had a really strong hand inside all of their internal and foreign affairs. So in that period of independence, uh, Gerardo Machado was president for a bit. And then he was ousted by the Cuban people following the market crash of 1929, which happened in the United States as well. Um, after that, uh, Carlos, Manuel de Céspedes, uh, Carlos Manuel de Céspedes y Quesada was president, and he wrote the Cuban Constitution in 1932, 
which even though the governments have changed since then, uh, that's still the constitution of Cuba today. Um, so then 1933, uh, Fulgencio Batista y Salvador took over and he was a ruthless, horrible dictator between 1933 and 1958. Uh, the island was going through economic collapse. There was uh, organized crime and mafias taking over large parts of Havana and the nearby coastal areas. And um, basically this time was really bad for everyday Cuban people. And most of the Cuban middle class uh, went from being at a comfortable middle class level to being extremely poor. So now you have conditions that are really ripe for a revolution to occur. So the revolution started when um, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and um, I believe 82 other passengers um, who were, they were communist and they were exiled in Mexico City by uh, Batista's dictatorship. And so they went back to Cuba in 1953, landing at Sierra Maestra, which is a small town um, in Eastern Cuba. And uh, excuse me, that was, yeah, so they attacked the barracks in Santiago of the dictator, and then they went to Mexico. Then in 1956, they came back on this yacht called La Granma, um, and they were immediately assaulted by the dictator's troops, and only 20 of the 82 passengers on that boat survived. So following that, uh, this became a populist revolution, and at the time, Fidel and Che Guevara, even though they were... Uh, like loyal to the Marxist communist theories, they were not outwardly saying that they wanted Cuba to become communist. They just said that they wanted to take the power back for the people. And so you see revolutions like the one on the left, which is uh, right on the steps of the University of Havana. Um, there's populist revolutions like this all around the country. And um, in a very short amount of time, all of Cuba started rising up against Batista and against the horrible conditions he created as uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos and these different uh, revolutionaries all had their little bands and they started slowly moving from Eastern Cuba where they came on that boat, La Granma, all the way to Western Cuba um, because the capital West is kind of in Western Cuba. And some of you might've heard some of those names before of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. If you've heard about the Cuban revolution before, those might sound familiar. They're certainly controversial figures these days. Um, so on December 31st, 1958, shots could be heard all around the city of Havana as the communist army advanced from the recently won Battle of Santa Clara, which is a mostly student city in central Cuba. Um, facing little opposition, the forces of Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos took over the capital as Fidel and his band went on a long victory march through central Cuba all the way to Havana, um, arriving in the capital on January 8th, 1959, roughly a week after this takeover, and setting up a provisional revolutionary government. So here I have some really unusual pictures because they're color pictures from 1959. Um, but I think it shows you a little bit at this time the way that uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and his revolutionaries were um, it, it really was a populist revolution at the beginning, especially, um, you know, you saw huge amounts of people in the streets and military parades throughout Havana, and the people were really excited and really happy to effectively take back control of their island. So after the revolution between 1959 and 1961, it was a bit unclear what exactly was going to happen in Cuba. Um, Fidel Castro had originally been planning, or he at times had said he wanted to set up a democratic government, um, but the United States did not support his revolution. It was a populist revolution, and they were afraid that the same sort of thing could happen in the U.S., um, because the 1960s were a really turbulent decade all around the world, um, but especially here in the Americas. So uh, without U.S. support, Castro had to turn to the other great world power, which at the time was the United States of Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union. And in 1961, he declared himself a Marxist-Leninist publicly. Uh, it's a bit unclear whether he had been unsure of which philosophy to follow or whether he did that knowing that he would get uh, a huge amount of monetary support from the Soviet Union. But uh, from that moment on, he got a lot of support from the USSR, um, a lot of money, a lot of subsidies, that sort of thing. 
And uh, in that moment when he declared himself a Marxist-Leninist, that is immediately when he became a huge threat to the United States and the United States decided that they wouldn't support his government. So in 1962, I'm sure some of you have heard of this. Um, there was this thing called the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was uh, an effort by the CIA in the United States to send a bunch of Cuban exiles back to Cuba to take over the government and uh, rouse popular support for a democratic capitalist government. Um, that didn't work. Most of the people supported Fidel Castro's government and it ended up being a huge embarrassment for the United States, made us look really bad on the global stage. Um, even though throughout American history, there've been many, many, many instances of the US trying to uh, dip our fingers into other countries' affairs. Um, and there was also the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is when right in Havana, there was a Soviet uh, missile launching base installed aimed at Florida. Um, there weren't any nuclear missile heads there, but they were ready to put them there if necessary. And that really scared the US, obviously. Um, that was in August of 1962. And then the US placed a full embargo on Cuba in 1962, which remains in place today. So skipping ahead to Cuba today, um, following the fall of the USSR, Cuba became a really poor uh, nation, much poorer than it had been before. There are frequent food shortages and goods shortages. 60 to 80% of food and goods have to be imported from other countries. And then since the 90s, uh, they've gone from a purely communist society to a quasi-capitalist kind of socialist society, um, simply because their economy was in such bad shape that they had to have some amount of uh, local business and entrepreneurship and tourist income in order to survive as a country and a government. And with that, uh, the embargo in addition, the US is one of the largest uh, trading countries in the world. So without the support of the US, and then since the 90s, we've actually threatened other countries to not support Cuba as well. Um, this has led to a situation where it's pretty regular to see scenes like this in Cuba, either nearly empty supermarkets or when there are goods there, it's typically a store full of one random thing. So for example, they might have uh, four aisles worth of baby formula and everyone stocks up on baby formula because they don't know when they're going to find it again and then it's disappeared. And this sort of thing happens all the time in Cuba. They have only a couple sorts of goods. It's very difficult to find things. And uh, a large reason of that is the U.S.'s refusal to trade with Cuba. And this idea of the shortage of goods and not being able to buy what you want to buy is a is a not an idea or something that we see very often in the United States. But we have seen a little bit of it this year with coronavirus. So I don't know if any of you experienced this. If you you or your parents went to the grocery store back in March and you couldn't find toilet paper or Kleenex or paper towel or if there's any other foods. I know that sometimes like the bread aisles were empty for a little while. Um, so this is something they might see Cuba um, in Cuba on a regular basis. Did anybody experience some of those shortages when they were at the grocery stores? You can give me a yes or a no. Great um, toilet paper shortage. Toilet paper shortage, yeah. We saw that here too. Do everybody... yeah, in Cuba in peacetime. Like in the best of times, you can't find things like toilet paper in Cuba, it's difficult to find uh, soap, cheese, meat, really basic things that we take for granted are pretty normal. And to have an empty supermarket like that, um, I saw that when I was in Cuba for three months last fall, and I saw that pretty frequently. It took me three weeks to find toilet paper when I got there, and I only found it because I took a day trip to the countryside where they don't have as bad shortages because they aren't overpopulated like Havana is with four million people. Um, so life there is very different and they don't have a lot of the uh, goods that we take for granted here. Yeah, and one thing Jake mentioned in one of his other presentations though is one thing that there's not a shortage on usually is fresh fruit. So on, a, on an island like Cuba, you, you still always, there's always food to eat. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certain products that, that um, are short, they're shortage sometimes, so. So this next slide is just a little about the COVID pandemic in Cuba. Um, Cuba was originally marketing itself as a COVID free place for a couple of weeks. And they were saying, hey, we don't have any COVID, come visit us and escape COVID. And then uh, roughly three weeks after they started that marketing campaign, um, COVID was brought to Cuba by a bunch of Italian tourists. And uh, it really blew up 
um, due to the autocratic communist government that they have there, they were able to put an incredibly harsh lockdown in place. People couldn't leave their house between, I think, 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. You can't leave at all at night. Um, so it was an island-wide hard lockdown, no going between towns, no going between cities. Uh, masks were legally mandated in all public spaces, um, which you can imagine is difficult in a country where it's hard to find consumer goods, clothing. Um, and there were doctoral students going house to house in Havana doing tests. One of my friends is a medical student in Havana, and she said that they just all of a sudden canceled classes and said, nope, now you're going and giving people COVID tests all the time. And you can't say no to that because of the nature of their government. It's just how it is. Um, so there's been wide scale economic ruin because the country is largely dependent on tourism and has had to shut its borders down. Uh, there's been hunger, difficulty finding food, and due to their extremely dated medical technology and lack of imports from the US due to the embargo, um, the situation has become really dire there. Uh, and it hasn't been this bad since the 1990s. Things are really rough in Cuba right now. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting to compare um, how COVID has affected the United States and other countries. Um, and some people complain in the US about the restrictions here and there's some harder restrictions in other countries. Um, and again, there's a lot of people that have suffered from unemployment and job loss in the United States, but also um, and hunger in, in other countries as well. Yeah, and they've actually already had a second lockdown in Cuba and then got out of it, and they're looking at a possible third lockdown soon. So uh, on April 30th of this year, the United Nations issued a statement saying the U.S. must urgently lift its blockade on Cuba to save lives amid the expanding COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the United Nations and other supranational um, non-governmental groups often say that the U.S.'s embargo on Cuba is inhumane because it leads to the lack of goods, the starvation that we saw in the last slides. And this is only worsened by something like this pandemic when the US, who's one of the world's largest providers of medical technology and equipment, isn't giving anything, any medicine to Cuba. So they're really struggling uh, with COVID down there. And despite all of this, uh, so President Obama visited Cuba for 72 hours in 2010, I believe it was. He was the first sitting president to visit since 1928. He reopened the American embassy, the American embassy in Havana um, and kind of started to thaw relations a bit. It's called the Cuban thaw. However, officially the embargo remains in place. So even though our countries are, our relations are getting slightly better, um, the embargo is still in place. It's still very difficult to get goods there. And uh, the US is often criticized for having this embargo in place for so long. 